When I was 23 years old, I did a secret Mormon initiation ceremony where I got new religious underwear and I also received a new name. Hi, my name is Alyssa Grenfell and I am an ex-Mormon content creator and author and this video is going to be all about what it's like to get the washing and anointing the secret ceremony in a Mormon temple. I'm going to cover an overview of what the ceremony entails. I'm also going to discuss the origins of the ordinance back to Joseph Smith along with how the ordinance has changed over time and become a little bit more watered down, what it's like to wear the religious underwear, and when uh, what it was like for me to be a temple worker when I did this ceremony, I performed or orchestrated this ceremony myself. If you're new here, just a reminder to please like and subscribe to my channel if you want to learn more about Mormonism, if you're investigating and learning more about the church, if you're an ex-member and you're kind of dealing with what it is to be an ex-Mormon and sifting through stories and people's experiences. A lot of people know me from my short form content, but this long form content is really great for me to be able to make because there's so much to explain about Mormonism that a short form one minute video that I put on YouTube shorts really isn't enough to, to really explain what all of this means, the background, and honestly too, to just share my story and what it was like for me to go through these things and to kind of connect more with you guys, to read the more in-depth comments, to have people go through and share their stories. And so please, if you like this video, do something to engage with it just so that it gets shared with more people and so that people who are looking for this type of content can find it easily. I have my devil's bean juice with me here today uh, to help me through this journey with you where I will explain what it's like to be washed and anointed. The washing and anointing is a special sacred ceremony that happens in all Mormon temples. So if you've ever driven past a Mormon temple, it's a big white building, usually has a golden man on the top. He holds a trumpet, which signifies that he's spreading the gospel to the world, the Mormon gospel. I've done several other videos about some of the things that happen in the temple. One of them is baptisms for the dead, where you are baptized in behalf of someone who's passed away that didn't get the chance to be baptized as a Mormon. There's also the endowment ceremony that happens in the temple. That's where you see uh, the people wearing the fig leaf apron, the a, uh, the interesting hats, and uh, they do the different symbols and handshakes during that. Uh, that is what comes after the washing and anointing. And if you want to learn more about that, I have videos for that that I will link below. The last thing that happens in a Mormon temple outside of the washing and anointing is a temple marriage. Uh, to go get married in the temple and really to do anything in the temple, you do have to be a worthy adult member of the church. Throughout the video, I will be putting different pictures and articles just screenshotted here. That's purely just to provide evidence that what I'm sharing is actually true because often people know Mormons, people have met Mormons, people know Mormon missionaries. But if I share some of these things specifically that happen in the temple, people just don't believe it because it's so strange. Most people know Mormons and so the idea that there's a secret initiation ceremony where you get religious underwear that's never supposed to be talked about is kind of so outlandish that people don't actually believe that I'm telling the truth. Not because I think they even think I'm a liar, but because it's so strange that a mainstream religion has these very culty aspects that that's why I add these photos and these screenshots purely just to provide kind of evidence that what I'm saying is true. The washing and anointing is meant to prepare you or initiate you to wear the religious underwear, but also to go on to the endowment ceremony. So these two ceremonies, these two ordinances are really meant to go hand in hand. Uh, and when you go through for the first time through the temple, you do one and then the other. So first, when I went through, you go and do the washing and anointing you get the religious underwear and then right after immediately after you go and you do the endowment ceremony the endowment and the washing and anointing are meant to essentially anoint you if you're righteous enough to become a king or a queen and a priest or priestess in the afterlife and so it's basically a way to kind of secure your place in heaven of course conditional upon your righteousness since i left the mormon church i unfortunately gave up the promise that I will be a queen in the afterlife. And so uh, it, it is conditional, but when you go through, I'll read the, the, the final words of the anointing. 
Uh, this is the words for if you are a man, they and if for a woman, it's a queen or a priestess. Confirm upon you this anointing wherewith you have been anointed in the temple of our God, preparatory, preparing to become a king and a priest unto the most high God, hereafter to rule and reign in the house of Israel forever and seal upon you all the blessings hereunto appertaining through your faithfulness. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So essentially, uh, the reason Mormons believe that this uh, ceremony, this ordinance is so important is because while baptism is meant to kind of wash your sins away and help you accept the atonement of Jesus Christ, this is almost kind of a capstone of your religious experience, something even greater than baptism. So while baptism helps you accept Jesus as your savior, the endowment is securing your place as a king or queen amongst God's most elect people upon, you know, once you're righteous, if you're righteous throughout your life. As I kind of mentioned, this, uh, this stuff is all very secretive. Um, and this video and the contents in this video are going to be considered very offensive to active believing members of the church. Uh, you're supposed to keep most of this a complete secret. You can talk about it in generalities, um, but you're not supposed to reveal the words of the prayer. You're not really supposed to talk about it really specifically. So, you know, there are some, um, I'll put a screenshot here of, there's a popular uh, Instagrammer, you know, more active member because she speaks the most candidly about these things. So if you want a faithful take, or if you want just more proof that what I'm saying is true, uh, you can watch her videos because she does, uh, talk about these things openly, somewhat openly from a faithful perspective. And I think her channel is quite manipulative because she really downplays and kind of gaslights people into believing that if you're thinking that any of this is strange, that's because you are bigoted and you're not accepting of other people's religion. Uh, this is a pretty common Mormon tactic Well, they'll, they'll say, you know, well, um, in the Muslim religion, people wear hijabs. That's a religious garment. And so uh, we're the same. So, you know, why can't you uh, see us and value our religious beliefs as the same? Or they'll also compare it to, you know, in Catholicism, there's a lot of religious clothing. There's a lot of religious rites and ordinances. And so Mormons will often say, well, look at them. They have this. Uh, why can't you respect us in the same way you respect them? I will say, I believe all religion deserves to be criticized. And all religion has been used to put women down, put down people of color, used to justify murder. And so I'll just say, I don't respect all religions. Uh, the reason I talk about Mormonism is because I spent 23 years as a Mormon. My entire family is Mormon and my ancestry in the Mormon church goes back to Joseph Smith. So I do. Uh, the reason I talk so much about Mormonism is purely because that's where my area of expertise is. I don't think that all religion deserves respect though. That being said, the difference between, you know, a Catholic right a, a Catholic religious right is fundamentally different from Mormonism. Same with hijab, purely because uh, it's not super ultra secretive. So if I wanted to see a photo of a Catholic religious right, or if I wanted to ask my Catholic friend about one of these uh, practices that they do, they wouldn't shock, like look at me with complete shock. They wouldn't uh, clutch their pearls. They wouldn't end the friendship. Um, if I Google or watch a video, you know, you can go watch videos of religious rites happening in a Catholic church. You're not going to see angry, angry, hateful comments in the comment section, like you probably will on a video like this or one of my other videos about what happens in the temple. Uh, it's the secrecy that is fundamentally different. Um, and, you know, not that those religions don't have their own secrets, obviously, but uh, the reason I think Mormonism and what happens in the temple is very particular is that it is so ultra secretive that everything that I will describe today has been practiced for over a hundred years and though I grew up in the church spending hours and hours and hours every single week uh, going to church, going to youth activities, spending time with my ultra Mormon parents, I literally never had a single idea, not one ounce of an idea of what happened in a Mormon temple. That level of secrecy, the idea that you can dedicate your entire life to a religion 
and that you're, you see your parents, your adult parents, dedicating their entire life to a religion and have not one iota of information about the temple shows how deeply, deeply secretive it is within the church, within the culture of the church. If you are an active member and you do want to get more information about what happens at the temple, you essentially have to seek out anti-Mormon or ex-Mormon or irreligious, you know, sources purely because there will be so few sources out there that are faith-based that are easy to find because the church tells you and you're expected to keep it a secret. As I said, the washing and anointing does happen in a Mormon temple. To go in the Mormon temple, you do have to have something called a temple recommend. This is a card that essentially says that you've had a religious leader, your bishop, sign off on the fact that you are righteous enough to enter the temple. Righteous enough meaning, you know, you're not having sex outside of marriage, you aren't using drugs, you're not drinking coffee. I will link below the entire list of questions, but there is a lengthy list of questions your bishop asks you that you need to be able to sign off on that you believe in these things you practice these things and if you pass the test if you uh if your bishop signs off then you are able to enter the temple you also have to you know agree to pay 10 percent of your income in order to enter enter the temple so there is a pretty hefty entry fee of 10 percent of everything you've ever made in your entire life one of the most fascinating aspects of the temple is the level to which it has changed over time. And so what I'll share with you today is the modern version of the washing and anointing. But everything from the way the garments look to the way the washing and anointing is administered to the endowment ceremony to even, you know, polygamy and now to monogamy, so much of the religion and what happens in the temple itself has changed just fundamentally over time. And many would say it's really been watered down, uh, which is why you see a cult like the FLDS, uh, which is actually in many ways much more similar to the early church, the Joseph Smith's church, than the modern Mormon church, which is the biggest faction of the Mormon church of, of the break off of, you know, the original Joseph Smith uh, what he started. There are so many sects that came out of Joseph Smith, um, but the, the the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that is the largest, that is the wealthiest, but in many ways they've sacrificed or gotten rid of a lot of the most, you know, culty or uh, stuff that freaks people out the most. Um, purely in, I think, the, the pursuit of staying as mainstream as possible. For example, even... The fact that they gave up polygamy in order to have Utah become a state, I think, shows that uh, the, the most uh, mainstream version of the Mormon church has always been willing to, you know, give black people the priesthood in the late 1970s. Uh, they've always been willing to make changes when they've been threatened with uh, getting pulled apart or when they've been threatened with legal action. And so uh, just in the same way the church has changed lots of doctrines over time from polygamy to uh, black people receiving the priesthood, you'll see uh, in the section where I talk about how the temple ordinances have changed, specifically the watching and anointing, um, that they've really gotten rid of a significant amount of the original ordinance that Joseph Smith revealed uh, to the early saints. When you do the washing and anointing for the first time, that ordinance is for yourself. So when I went through, it was for my own name, Alyssa Grenfell, and I received the garment for myself, Alyssa Grenfell. However, people go back to the temple throughout their entire lives. This is not because they are receiving the ordinance for themselves. This is because they are doing it for and in behalf of those who have passed away. I mentioned baptisms for the dead, where you are getting baptized for the souls of the people who are waiting to receive their ordinances in the afterlife. Similarly so, you are married for people in the afterlife in the temple, you are um, washed and anointed for people in the afterlife, and you see, receive the endowment. And so these corners, these... And so these ordinances are meant to be received by everyone. And when people go back again and again, it's not because they are, you know, almost 
like taking the sacrament every week. They're doing it for themselves again. They're doing it for those who have passed away. And so when I received the washing and anointing for myself the first time, when I went back a second time to do it again, I got my little piece of pink paper in, with the name of someone who has passed on and I say their name out loud. They have you say their name out loud to signify that you are doing that ordinance for the person who has passed away. If you are someone who experienced the washing and anointing for yourself, I would absolutely love it and appreciate it if you would type your experience a brief tidbit into the chat just to serve as a little bit of a record so people can scroll through while they listen to the video of people's personal experiences with the washing and anointing. In my next video, I plan on doing a little bit of a Q&A of frequently asked questions. And so if you have a question you'd like me to answer, please type it into the chat as well. And in my next video, I will take some time in that video to answer some of the more commonly asked questions about uh, my experience, my channel, but also about Mormonism at large. Let's jump into a description of what the ceremony currently looks like. This is more or less the ceremony that I experienced. This is gonna be an overview of the washing and anointing, receiving the new name, and uh, getting the garment for the first time. To describe this though, I'm over here now, I'm going to use a little bit of a whiteboard purely because uh, describing this is particularly difficult because there's a lot of movement involved. Um, so I'm gonna draw it out as I explain it. You start the washing and anointing wearing kind of like a cloak that covers your front and your back. It's like a huge poncho basically. Once you have your cloak on, you enter a room where they have several stalls and in each stall, a different person is in there in the stall getting their washing and anointing done. So within the stall, once you enter, it's sectioned into fourths with curtains. So you would enter with the little stall door here and the first area is just where you uh, are sitting in your little cloak and kind of waiting your turn. So that's my cloak. Uh, in the stall, there are two people to perform the ordinance. So for a woman, it's two women, and for a man, it's two men. Once you enter, you receive the first portion of the ordinance, which is the washing. This is where they wash you and then they put their hands on your head to bless you. And they say the certain words, which I'm going to read now. This washing used to be literal in a bathtub, which I'll explain later. Uh, but now it's, as I've said, they've taken away some of the freakier parts. And now when they wash you, they just uh, stroke water across your forehead, basically. So if you were receiving the washing, I would uh, say these words, brother YouTuber having authority, I wash you preparatory to your receiving your anointings uh, that you may become clean from the blood and sins of this generation. And I will say as, um, as the person that's giving the blessing says each of these body parts, when I was a temple worker, we were told to gesture to these parts. I've been told now that they don't even gesture, they just say the words. Way back in the day, uh, which I'll explain more, they would touch these parts of your body. I wash your head that your brain and your intellect may be clear and active, your ears that you may hear the word of the Lord, your eyes that you may see clearly and discern between truth and error, your nose that you may smell. That one cracked me up because all of the rest of the body parts get something kind of holy or you know elevated, but your nose is just blessed to smell. I guess Joseph Smith couldn't think of anything special for your nose to be able to sniff out. Your lips that you may never speak guile, your neck that it may bear up your head properly, kind of also funny, your shoulders that they may bear the burdens that shall be placed thereon, your back that there may be marrow in the bones and in the spine. You can see it's all a little strange and like nonsensical. Your breasts that it may be the receptacle of pure and virtuous principles. So they really did used to touch you on the breast um, and, or, you know, later on, on the sternum. Now they don't. Uh, your vitals and bowels that they may be healthy and perform their proper functions so that you can poop well. Uh, your arms and hands that they may be strong and wield the sword of justice in defense of truth and virtue. Your loins that you may be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth that you may have joy in your posterity. Your legs and feet that you may run and not be weary and walk and not faint. So, uh, you know, it's funny to get some of these blessings and then just really wonder what they mean. So this is totally said in a vacuum. Um, 
you're walking into this totally having, like I said, literally no idea what's about to happen. So they just start saying this prayer. It used to be that they would touch you. Uh, now they just say the prayer. Uh, and they don't explain any of it. There's never a moment where there's a pause and they say any questions. Uh, they just they just say the words. They just do the ordinance. There's not really uh, a lot of opportunity to <laughs> say, what <laughs> are you doing? Um, and it's funny, too, because, you know, it says like, you know, your legs that you may run and not be weary and walk and not faint. I guess it's just supposed to be symbolic because certainly it's not like you suddenly have super strength where you can literally run and not be weary. Um, I guess it just, you know, you're supposed to say it's all just symbolic, but when it's all symbolic, but the symboli symbology is never explained, then it's just nonsense a little bit. So after they say those words, they uh, put their hands on your head and say, brother YouTuber, having authority, we lay our hands upon your head and seal upon you this washing that you may become clean from the blood and sins of this generation through your faithfulness in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Uh, that's the first part of the washing and anointing but we haven't been anointed yet. So then you go to the next section. So then you go to the next section, the people follow you through, and then you are anointed. So they put oil on your head and the prayer is essentially the same for this uh, second section. They say the same words, but instead of washing you, now they are anointing you. So I guess it's, you know, like I said, they never explain it. Basically they're washing you of dirtiness and then they are anointing you to receive the blessings. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, the only difference really is that at the end of the anointing, then you receive the blessing that I said at the beginning of the video, which is that you're going to become a queen or king priest or priestess to the most high God and that you're going to rule and reign with him forever. After you're finished being anointed, you go up into this final section of the booth the stall. And this is where you receive the new name. And if you're going through for yourself for the first time, this is also where you receive the garment. So they would start, they would tell you essentially, now you can start wearing the garment. This is how you're supposed to wear it, which I'll read the words in a second. And they give you the new name. When, when I went through, they basically just hand you the garments. Uh, it used to be though, that they would actually help you get dressed into the garments from what I've read online. Uh, they would say with this garment, I give you a new name, which you should always remember and which you must keep sacred and never reveal, except at a certain place that will be shown you hereafter. The name is blank. So uh, the new name that you receive here is meant to be carried with you later into the endowment session where you say the new name at the curtain in order to symbolize that you are giving the correct uh, words to enter through into the celestial room. Um, so it's kind of a code. It's basically a code to use later on in the temple. Uh, after you go through the temple yourself, this new name, you're never supposed to tell anyone. Um, the only other time you utter it out loud is when you get married, where uh, the woman tells the husband when they get married, her new name, but the husband never reveals his new name for the rest of his life. I'll also say too, that when you are told the new name, uh, it's kind of meant to be presented as this very, very special thing, almost as if, you know, when you arrive at the temple, someone in the temple prays over your name, Alyssa Grenfell, and spontaneously comes up with what the Lord wants your new name to be. Uh, that's how I always kind of pictured it to be when I was, you know, getting my new name when I was thinking over my new name. My new name is Ada, A-D-A-H. Um, however, that is not the case. Uh, the way that the new name is, you know, figured out for each day is that each day of the temple, everywhere in the world, across, across the globe, all people receive, all temples receive the same new name each day. And so anyone who was endowed and had the washing and anointing ceremony done for them, uh, anyone uh, across the globe for me that on the same day, their name was Ada too. So there's nothing special about it. And I also think that the reason maybe they do this is just so that um, if anyone forgets their new name, because people forget it and they can become very concerned about the fact that they forgot their new name, because, you know, this experience is really overwhelming. And so, you know, people go through, they are having these green aprons, 
in their face. You're in the prayer circle. You're being washed. Oil is being put on your head. Uh, you know, all of this stuff is being done. And in the hubbub of it all, uh, some people forget their new name. Uh, and you're never supposed to write it down. You're never supposed to speak it. I even heard stories about how people wouldn't say or write it down because if Satan found out your new name, he would have way more power over you. And so I would, you know, you're, you're basically never supposed to say it. And that I think leads to people forgetting it. There's also stories of people even on their deathbed who are so concerned about not remembering their new name and they freak out about it. So uh, basically I think the reason that they have this, you know, everybody gets the same new name on the same day is so that in your membership record, they can see the date of your ordinance and they can go into their little database and they can say, okay, well, if you were, you know, ordained on February 5th, 1972, I see that your, the men were named this, the women were named this. And so this is your temple name. Uh, and so it, it's kind of like a clerical thing, honestly, but, uh, there is an ex Mormon website called the temple Oracle, uh, where you can go and you can look up anyone's new name at that's ever existed. And so it's actually kind of funny cause you'll see ex Mormon saying, Hey, you know, my sister was endowed last year. I, I know the date it took place. So I actually know their new name. Isn't that kind of funny? Cause it's supposed to be the most secret thing on earth, basically, but it's not that hard to figure out, you know, what people's new names are if you just have a little bit of information about them. Now that you understand the ordinance and you know what happens, let's talk about where Mormons say it comes from and why, you know, why do this? What's the rationale? So there is a scripture. This is a scripture present that was presented to me when I received my endowment. Um, and I believe they also talk about this scripture in the temple prep class. And I will say, like, you know, I said I was pretty blindsided. They do have a temple prep class. There's always a Mormon in the comments saying, you should have been prepared because you had a temple prep class. Okay. Uh, it's very unhelpful. It's essentially like if I was trying to prepare you to drive a car and you've never seen a car before, you're like pre-car era type of, you know, individual. And I take you into a room and I say, sometimes things can move with some power and that thing can move and humans can do it end of conversation. Uh, would that give you, would that give you clarity? You know, would, would you literally be able to picture a car after me giving you that description? No, uh, you would just think, okay, are you talking about a carriage, I guess? Or, you know, if something can move because people move it, are you talking about moving furniture? Um, you know, so anyways, that's just an analogy I just came up with. So, you know, it's not perfect, but mostly just they're so incredibly vague about it that it's almost like plausible deniability where they're like, we prepared you, um, but we didn't literally we didn't say almost anything specific. And so, you know, you probably just feel like I was prepared, but I was not prepared at all. This scripture was used. And while it does literally use the words that uh, the ceremony uses, it doesn't uh, provide any, anything specific that's going to help you understand what the ordinance is going to be like. So this is Exodus 40. It's from the Bible, uh, Exodus 40 verses 12 and 13. And thou shalt bring Aaron and his sons unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and wash them with water washing verse 13. And thou shalt put upon Aaron, the holy garments and anoint him and sanctify him that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. So, and so this verse has been used to le give legitimacy to the temple ceremony because it uses the word water, it uses the word anoint, and it uses the word holy garments. And so just like many aspects of the Bible, uh, if you work hard enough, you can pull a lot of things out of there. So this is the verse that is kind of the, the number one verse the church uses to say, hey, look, this was in the Bible. Um, there are other instances in the Bible of people being washed to go into the temple, anointed to go into the temple. We also see, you know, Jesus washing the feet uses an example of washing. There is a book called the Encyclopedia of Mormonism, which I will link uh, below. Um, and in that, this is a Mormon friendly encyclopedia. It's on the BYU website if you want a faithful point of view. And uh, this kind of cobbles together many different verses that talk about the washing and anointing in the Bible. I think that this in large part is 
used as a way for Mormons to kind of be like, look, it's in the Bible. We are restoring Christ's original church. Um, however, this ceremony was introduced to by Joseph Smith to other, you know, his members of the church a few months after he finished uh, becoming a Mason. And so, you know, um, while these verses are kind of used to legitimize uh, this ceremony, the context under which Joseph Smith introduced this to the saints was more out of masonry and the Masonic markings on the garments, which I'll go grab to show. Uh, more is birthed from masonry and what Joseph Smith stole and learned as a mason um, more than, you know, him resurrecting these ancient traditions that we find in the Bible. Let me go grab the garments. So this is what the women's garments look like. So uh, these are Mormon garments. My husband was able to buy them from the church distribution center a few months ago because he's still technically a member. So surprise, you can actually still, you know, he's not gone for so long, but my name is off the records of the church. His name is still on because he hopes to get excommunicated. Um, but uh, so these are up to date garments. Um, these look very similar to what I wore seven years ago. Uh, the you know, it kind of just looks like a white shirt. Um, you know, nothing that special about it. If these were very uncomfortable to wear, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit when I share my personal experience. The most important part of the garments are the symbols that are sewn into them. These are Masonic symbols connected back to masonry. This is the compass, which goes over the left breast. This is the square, which goes over the right breast. And this is a ruler or the line, which goes over the navel. Uh, if you go outside of a Masonic temple, you'll see these symbols on, uh, out, <laughs> you'll see these symbols outside of every single Masonic temple, you know, anywhere in the world. Then on the pant over the knee is the final symbol. This is also just a ruler. I explain more about what these symbols mean in my video about garments. This is the men's. You can see instead of having room for the breasts, it's just like a typical t-shirt. This is what the packaging looks like. These are maybe about three, four, five dollars each. And so you're supposed to wear them every single day, day and night throughout your life, uh, except for when you're basically showering, having sex or swimming. So once you're endowed, once you have the garments, you're supposed to wear them basically till you die. Here's, and there's different fabrics too. Some of them are more spandexy. Some of them are, you know, whatever this is called, um, like netting. This is called the Corbin texture. So they're all a little bit different. You can kind of choose whatever is the most comfortable for you. Now that I've explained a little bit about what Mormons say is the origin story of the washing and anointing ceremony, let's talk a little bit about what uh, the actual history is. Uh, Wikipedia does a great job uh, breaking down the different eras of the washing and anointing, especially in the early days of the saints. As Wikipedia states, uh, as the Latter-day Saints were completing their first temple in Kirkland, Ohio, founder Joseph Smith led many prominent males, uh, male members in a pre-endowment ritual pattern after similar washing and anointings described in the Bible. This ritual took place beginning on January 21st, 1836 in the attic of a printing office. Uh, their bodies were washed with water and anointed with perfume, and then their heads were anointed with consecrated oil. Oil that's consecrated is oil that's been blessed by a priesthood holder. Soon after the temple dedication on March 27th, around 300 Latter-day Saint men participated in further ritual washing of feet and faces. Two months after his initiation into Freemasonry, Joseph Smith administers the first endowments on the upper floor of his Nauvoo store. And so it's very interesting to talk to active members about Freemasonry because some of them will say uh, it has literally nothing to do with it. 
um, that Joseph Smith had no, really no true association with Freemasonry. Uh, other members will lean into it and say that Freemasonry is a vehicle through which uh, Jesus and God held these sacred ordinances, you know, on the earth, and that when Joseph Smith gained access to these ordinances, he was able to restore them to their original truth. And so the relationship between Joseph Smith and Freemasonry within the act of Mormon belief, I think is somewhat, um, there's like definitely a disagreement there as to how the origin plays into the role of the modern temple. Uh, but um, there are so many similarities that I think it's kind of undeniable that there is some clear association. I think if you want to know my personal uh, take on this, it's that Joseph Smith was really great at cobbling together lots and lots of different things to make his own thing. And so with uh, the Book of Mormon, we see the Book of the Hebrews, another book of the time. We see a lot of uh, stuff from the Bible taken. We see a lot of words and place names where he lived used. And so I think he really was a master at taking these disparate parts and kind of inventing something that felt new and different. And so he's taking from free Freemasonry, but he's also taking verses from the Bible and he's cobbling it together so that it feels like he's almost inventing. And I think the word restoration is a is such a fascinating use of that word because it makes it so that he can steal from Freemasonry, from books of the time, from histories of the time, from, you know, stories of the Native Americans. He can steal all of that. But when you, he uses the term, when the church uses the term restoration, it doesn't feel like thievery at all. It feels like uh, he is bringing back what was lost. He is uh, bringing back Christ's true church, right? So it's not stealing anymore. It's taking these pieces that have been broken apart or these, uh, these truths that have been degraded over time, and he is restoring them back to their original truth and their original beauty. So it's such an interesting rebranding of the word steal, uh, because instead of stealing from the Masons, he is restoring the original truths that were uh, brought by the Masons, and he's bringing them back to their full level of truthiness. So in Kirkland, is where the uh, endowment and the Washington anointing begin in the Nauvoo period. The Latter-day Saints move to Nauvoo. He changes up the Washington anointing rituals. At this point, the first woman is able to partake in these uh, ceremonies. The first woman, which is Joseph Smith's wife, Emma, was inducted into the endowment ceremony in 18. 43. This is the most fascinating to me. So this, to me, uh, what I'm about to read is kind of the true origin story and seems to be m more of like when the ordinance begins to become codified and has some real structure. You know, I just read that part about where they're washing their feet, they're washing their faces. They're kind of doing these things that uh, are not seen at all in the modern endowment ceremony or in the modern, um, washing and anointing, um, where they're doing it with men or men do it with women, you know, it, it's kind of a, a little bit like whatever is coming into Joseph Smith's mind at the time, the saints are just doing, um, there's not as there is today, this incredibly, uh, thorough list of this is exactly how the ordinance must be done. Now, every single ordinance has, incredibly detailed rules as to how it's supposed to be administered, what's supposed to be worn, what's supposed to be said. Back when Joseph Smith was doing it, it was kind of just like whatever he's kind of feeling in the moment. Hey, let's try this. Let's do this. You do. The, now it's men. Now let's let women do it. Um, there's not this uh, rigid set of rules that he's orchestrating. So the ceremony almost morphs over time to become what it is today. As the Washington anointings were practiced in Nauvoo, men and women were taken to separate rooms where they disrobed and when called upon, passed through a canvas curtain to enter a tub where they were washed head to foot while words of blessing were recited. Then oil from a horn was poured over the head of the participant, usually by another officiator, while similar words were repeated. 
As part of the ceremony, participants were ordained to become king and queens in eternity. Men performed the ritual for men, and women performed the ritual for women. As part of the ceremony, participants were given a new name and a ritual undergarment were in which symbolic marks were snipped into the fabric. In the early Utah period, the washing and anointing also was used sometimes for sick people. So sick people received the same ceremony. Now uh, there is consecrated oil used in the church for sick people it's not in the temple though it can be used on anyone from little babies to adults to strangers and th and so that is an explanation of what it was like in the early church uh, as they were kind of uh figuring out what this ceremony was going to be and it's so interesting to me you know going through the modern church temple and experiencing this ceremony that's very rigid, that's very uh, prescribed as to what you're supposed to be doing, what you're supposed to be wearing, like I said. And to find out that the original ceremony was this hod hodgepodge of different people doing different things, Joseph Smith introducing this here and here and here, and not this almost, you know, when you go through the temple now, I think you feel like you are receiving the same exact uh, ceremony that Joseph Smith revealed to the saints back in the day. That is definitely how I felt. I felt like these are the exact words. These are the exact actions. Everything I'm doing from top to bottom, from the way the oil is put on my head to the way the water is wiped across my forehead, this is exactly how Joseph Smith taught the saints to do it. Because this is meant to be the most holy eternal ceremony on the planet. Th this is the most, you know, these are the pearls of God's gospel, basically. Um, and so to find out that it actually started, you know, in the attic of a print shop and that there were uh, initially it was just men and they were doing the, you know, washing the face and it, you know, it was kind of a little bit of chaos while Joseph Smith is kind of nearing in, honing in on what this ceremony is supposed to be from a doctrinal perspective, it, it is interesting to see that it isn't just this one revealed truth, but rather this chaos of events that over a hundred years is then orchestrated into this almost bureaucratic uh, administration of this ceremony that has wildly changed over time and really almost in many ways doesn't represent at all the original ceremony that was given or presented by Joseph Smith. Just a reminder to like and subscribe. If you receive the washing and anointing for yourself, please type a story or a little tidbit of what it was like for you in the comments below. If uh, you have a question for me, please ask it and I'm gonna answer the some of those co most common ones in my video next week. If you are recovering from Mormonism, uh, which it does, you know, if you're if you receive the initiatory and you're still, you know, I mean, really most parts of Mormonism from the homophobia to the sexism to the culty parts of the temple. If you're recovering from Mormonism, please consider buying my book, How to Leave the Mormon Church. Uh, if you're even interested in hearing more about my story, I have a lot of personal stories in this book. So please consider checking it out if that those are you know topics that you're interested in. I will put the link to the Amazon listing below. I've shared a little bit of what it was like for me um, when I went through for the first time. I do feel like I was incredibly overwhelmed. Um, I think had I just been able to do the washing and anointing, I could have maybe sat with it for a little bit and considered uh, and processed it better. But having the washing and anointing take place immediately before the endowment was uh, like drinking from a fire hose, as they say. So you don't get a lot of time to process the fact that, you know, growing up, it really feels like you belong to a church that is maybe slightly odder than your average Christian church. Sure, we have the Book of Mormon. Um, that's about all you know, you know, that's kind of different. You have a lot of the same standards as other very Christian people. No dating, modesty, Sabbath day worship, taking the sacrament, baptism, these are all through lines to mainstream Christianity. And so when I'd, you know, be kind of mentally comparing notes with my other religious friends, I could feel like, oh, I 
I have, you know, I'm Christian too. Um, very similar to you in so many ways. And so it felt very normal. Um, I did see occasionally, you know, I knew my parents wore white clothing underneath all of their clothing. I knew they wore garments, but I, I don't think I really heavily questioned, especially like pre, you know, when I was maybe under 15 or 16, I wasn't really thinking about, you know, my parents underwear that much. And so, uh, I really did feel like I was pretty much, I felt like the church is what it says it was, which is the restoration of tr true Christianity. I felt like we're basically like Christians, but we have all of this extra stuff, which shows that we are the restoration of the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, um, it going into the temple though, suddenly you are faced with what everyone has kind of been side elbowing you your entire life, which is Mormonism is a bit of a cult. Um, and so when you enter in and you put on the religious underwear and you have oil put on your head and you're washed, and then you stand in a prayer circle and you do the handshakes and you're welcomed through the veil by a, an old man. You know, when all of these things are kind of culminating and happening to you, you're also processing for the first time that maybe, you know, your church is not what you thought it was. And there's been a lot of secrets. There have been a lot of secrets which have been held from you over the years. Um, when I wore garments for the first time, you know, I got you wear them of course as part of the endowment ceremony but when i went home i took a shower uh you know the first time i took a shower i had my my little when you're a woman it's a pink baggie uh, i had my two pink baggies at the top and the bottom sitting out on the counter um and i just i i just i honestly didn't even want to step out of the shower because it felt like if i put those on you know i just went through this whole temple experience and I hated it. I did not feel uh, empowered. I did not feel blessed. I just felt repulsion. And so I knew that for me to put on those garments was essentially synonymous with me accepting that that was okay with me, that everything that just happened was fine. That was fine. That was good. I had a great time, you know, I had a testimony of it. I believed in it. I believe that that is exactly what God was wanting me to do. And so, uh, I, I really stood there and I just stared at those two little pink baggies and I felt like almost like I was going to have to swallow my true feelings. I just swallow my true identity, swallow my true aversion to what had just happened to me. And just say, I will wear these white religious underwear for the rest of my life. And yes, I believe. And, you know, I was meant to go off to my mission in like a, about a week, you know, later. And so I just put it on. I put it on and I wore garments for maybe four years, five years before I left the Mormon church. And I after I kind of basically in that moment made a promise with myself that I'm OK with it. If my mom is doing this, if my dad's doing this, if everyone I've ever trusted as a me member of the Mormon church has done this, I, okay, I'm going to take it on faith, basically, literally, uh, but not even like my own faith, you know, not even my own good feeling, not even my own revelation, but merely the faith on which, uh, the faith of, you know, trusting my family and trusting the leaders and the members who I had known in throughout my life. The reason, the reason I will say that I wanted to become a temple worker is because I, the only part, literally the only part of the temple that I liked was the fact that in the temple, women give blessings. And as a woman, I had never seen that happen because women are barred from the priesthood. And I always really envied the boys passing the sacrament, the boy, you know, not just the fact that they got to do it, but the fact that I guess, you know, that they were um, men, just the fact that they were men. That was why they were able to do it. And so, you know, I feel like I'm going to say that. And inevitably, I get a comment from an old guy in the comments saying, it's not like there was anything that great about passing the sacrament. I had to get to church early. Well, 
at least you got the privilege. You know, the rest of us had to sit in the congregation staring at you, wishing we had the privilege too, that we had the power, literally the power of God. That's what they call it. So, you know, um, women are very looked down upon in the church. In my opinion, we're told, why do you even want, you know, power? You have the power of childbirth. Childbirth is the same as the power of God. Um, you know, well, a lot of women die in labor, so I'm pretty sure no one ever died from passing the sacrament. All they did was get to sit up on the stand and say their little prayer, sit up on the stand as a bishop, hold their child as they blessed them. And, you know, am I angry about this? I might be. I, uh, uh, as long as we're talking about sexism, I did mention earlier, you know, the husband gets to find out the new name and uh, the the husband never tells the new name also within the temple ordinance of uh, you know when they're you're married in the temple the husband receives the wife and the wife states that she will give herself there is no equality even attempted in a temple marriage you know in the ceremony ceremonial words themselves and so I also found that super you know frustrating the fact that I give my new name, I tell my secret name, but I don't get to know the secret. So one of my favorite parts of leaving the church was being able to say, what's your new name? Tell me. <laughs> and getting to finally find out my husband's new name, you know, and he knew mine. And finally, we get to only after leaving the religion of our childhood, uh, feel true, a true sense of equality, you know, in our marriage. And that was honestly kind of fun for both of us. I also think the whole special underwear thing does in many ways harken back to one of my biggest frustrations with Mormonism is this uh, high value placed on rule following, you know, like not drinking coffee, the idea, you know, that you would get to heaven and you see Jesus Christ and he really, really wants to know did you drink coffee? That's what the most powerful beings in the entire universe care about. They really care that humans don't drink coffee. Um, you know, I guess I could see alcohol. I can see the reasoning behind drugs, but coffee? Uh, and it's the same goes with underwear. You know, does Jesus, when, when I get to heaven, Jesus is going to say, did you wear the underwear correctly? Um, you know, that's, that's surprising to me. But if you don't wear the underwear correctly... Uh, that is breaking your temple covenants, and that's really serious. I think this is a lot of where religious scrupulosity comes from in Mormonism, because you're kind of taught that your salvation hinges on the most minute rules. And so, you know, it's not just about wearing the garment, but it's about do you wear the garment under the bra or over the bra? Because if it's under the bra, you are actually keeping Christ and the temple closer to you. And so that's more righteous. And so it, it very much feels like in Mormonism, there is always an answer for what is the most righteous uh, and what's the the good, better, best, you know, version. And so you're always trying to figure out as a Mormon, especially like for me, who was very much uh, earnestly wanting to follow the rules, what is the absolute best way for me to follow these rules? Because I don't want to just wear the garments. I don't want to wear them day and night. I want to wear them in exactly the way Jesus is going to be checking up on me. You know, I want to be the best Mormon I can be. And so it's a bit of a mind fuck because, you know, no matter what you're doing, there really can be a better version. Okay, so you're reading your scriptures. Are you reading them daily? How long are you reading them? Are you reading them for over an hour? Are you highlighting? Are you cross-referencing? Are you sharing what you read that day with your spouse? You know, just doing any of those things are not enough. Are you listening to them in your car during your commute? Are you listening to them on the way home? Are you talking to your kids about the scriptures? Um, you know, no matter what you're doing as a human being, you know, you always could be more righteous. And I think that was the part of Mormonism that really haunted me was that it always felt like I could be doing more. I could be more righteous. Sure, I'm, you know, praying, but am I praying earnestly? Am I praying on my knees? Am I praying for a long enough period of time? Um, there's so many metrics by which you can judge yourself as an active member of the church. And you're always going to fall short. You could always be doing more. And that's, I think, too, why part of me loved serving a mission was because there were so many rules and I could be following just this absolutely rigid schedule, not because I liked it, but because 
I felt like for the first time in my life, I can literally only be doing religious things. And so this is the best I've ever felt about myself because this is the way I know I'm a good person. For our last portion of the video, I wanted to talk a little bit more about how the ceremony has changed over time, specifically from the early 1900s to today. I talked about, you know, Kirkland, Nauvoo, how the ceremony was kind of originated but this section of the video is going to be dedicated towards how it then changed after Joseph Smith, you know, passed away, murdered, whatever, and then how it morphed through, you know, the, the 1900s. So I mentioned that, you know, in Joseph Smith's time, there was the bathtub until 1923, full nudity was required for all Mormon temple initiates as they sat in a bathtub so their naked bodies could be touched and washed with water and oil during the washing and anointing ceremony. So until the 1920, so until 1923, you were expected to be fully nude. You know, that's crazy. From 1923 on till 2005, initiates wore some uh, shield, basically the cloak I told you about with openings. So my cloak was just a full cloak. It was just a white sheet. Uh, from 1923 to 2005, though, that cloak had openings because they still were touching you on the body, you know, on skin to skin. So that cloak had openings near the crotch, breast, and butt areas to preserve some modesty while still allowing the officiator, still of the same sex, to slip their hands underneath for uh, the naked touching during the ceremony. So um, the crazy thing is, and I'm going to read a few uh, personal experiences from forums, 2005 not that long ago, I was born in 1992. So my parents, you know, when they went through this initiation ceremony for themselves, they were touched on the body. And I, I think, too, the crazy part about, you know, the, the ceremonies is so much of this is oral history. Keep in mind, as I said, you're heavily discouraged from ever writing this down from ever speaking about it. And so much of what we know about the washing and anointing over time is is really only from word of mouth, journal keeping, and then ex-members sharing publicly what happened in the temple. So really, in many ways, Mormonism is one of the few uh, oral traditions that is still alive. You know, most things are written down. Most things are digitized. Mormonism is one of the few things where the oral history is the only record by which we know what happened. There's not an official press release that goes out from the church that shares these deta the details, you know, the differences in the ceremonies. It's all just, you know, personal testimony that we that we have to rely on. I am going to read a few um, comments from a few forums. I'll also share in a link the forums below so that if you're curious to read more personal experiences, you can go to some of the forums I link below and read them for yourselves. I'm only going to read a few. This person says... In 1990, I did the naked with a poncho over me with open sides. Some old lady would anoint the different areas with water. This wasn't something where she'd drip water on you like they'd pour oil on your head during a blessing. She actually dipped her fingertips in water, then oil, then stroked it on my body. Uh, it was so long ago, though, I can't remember where all the anointing areas were. I went through in 2004. I was also naked under a poncho, which was wide open on both sides. So, um... There are different, you know, I, I think they must have had several different poncho uh, styles because there are some people who say that they had a poncho with the openings in the different areas. There are some people, though, who say that their poncho was basically like a front flap and a back flap with the, you know, slit in the side completely open. So that's what this person is saying. I went through in 2004. I was also naked under the, a poncho, which was wide open on both sides. I had to make sure to hold the sides closed. I went through for myself, then went back once to do it for the dead. One of the man, the guy who would reach into the poncho, grazed my personal area. It was weird. He didn't think much of it. It didn't even apologize. I wouldn't be surprised if he did it on purpose. So uh, there's a lot of stories for sure, especially of this early time, you know, prior to 2005, where people are just touching your body. Like they are fully touching your breasts, touching your private areas, and you are fully open to that. You know, that's called in everywhere else in the world, that's called sexual assault. Um, but because it's under this re secretive religious, you know, ceremony, you know, this person literally had a stranger touch him on the penis 
he didn't say anything about it, right? Um, mum's the word. And that's not because he wasn't uncomfortable, but that's because he was told that it was okay because he was doing it as part of a religious ceremony. I attended the temple scores of times during the last era of the naked hijinks, 1973 to 1991, no orifice anointing because my officiators were instructed to keep their culty fingers two inches from the pubic hair. I had my penis touched at least a dozen times. So, you know, this person is saying, it, sound, it sounds like in reading a lot of these, you know, the people who are doing the ceremony are told, you know, don't touch them, don't touch their private parts, but then it happens. You know, it happens in most of these, you know, it happens in a lot of these people's testimonies, their stories that even though they're not supposed to touch, they touch. So it, it just seems like a, obviously an opportunity for predatory behavior to run rampant because oops i accidentally touched you seems like something that happened to a lot of people this person says um touching the genital areas wasn't a proof procedure but some people have reported that they personally were touched in their genital areas i mean full-on directly touched or groped in other words they were sexually assaulted as i said if you want to read more of those stories you can go uh to some of the links you can also just google washing and anointing experience reddit or whatever there's lots of people sharing these experiences online uh i think too like i shared the whole you know sexual assault thing i feel like it's almost like you code it differently in your brain where you know if a stranger on the street touched you in your genitals you call the police um but if that happens in a mormon temple under these circumstances you think that was an accident or, you know, this is part of the ceremony, I, you know, w whatever it is, your rationale, you are very much e expecting or thinking that it, it, this is part of my religion. And so it's almost like I, I feel like I, you know, put it in the same category of like being in the doctor's office. If you have the doctor inspecting something, you know, down there in the genital region, you know, they're still touching you, but you are, they think it's okay. You know, it's okay if a doctor does this. And I think in the same way you might trust a doctor, you trust your religion, right? And so I think the brain kind of codes it differently. But then for those who leave in hindsight, you see that this was obviously very uncomfortable, uh, considered for most sexual assault. Um, and I think that's why ultimately in 2005, they chose to get rid of these, this more intensive form of, you know, the washing and anointing, because I don't know if they were threatened with a lawsuit. That seems like why they usually change rules. But uh, I think that they saw it as something that was making a lot of people uncomfortable. And this ordinance is making it so that very old men and women, you know, are getting access to the bodies of very young people who are being told that this is normal, this is part of your religion, and whoops, I grazed your penis, you know, I touched your genitals, uh, and and that's pretty horrible, uh, I think. I think that's why we haven't seen lawsuits against the church for this. Uh, I kind of wish someone would bring a lawsuit, but who knows, probably statute of limitations is such that anything that happened in 2005, you could no longer... Litigate. I have no idea. Um, but I know that, you know, there's a lot of people who have shared they basically feel like they were sexually assaulted in a Mormon temple um, under the guise of a religious ordinance. Whew. Well, this video is a doozy. I feel like anytime I talk about the Mormon temple, it, it helps me, you know, get slapped in the face with the reminder that I really was in a cult. Um, because if you have to talk about washing and anointing and getting a new name and wearing a fig apron and getting the secret handshake to get into heaven, maybe you might be in a cult. You are recovering from Mormonism. If you want to learn more about my story, please check out my book, How to Leave the Mormon Church, An Ex-Mormon's Guide to Rebuilding After Religion. Uh, I spend about two years writing this book. I today actually, I finally have the appointment to go record the audiobook. So that is finally coming soon. Uh, if you're interested in that, uh, if you have a question, please drop it in the chat. We'll be answering some of those next week. And please, please, number one, ask if you have an experience with the washing and anointing, please share your experience below so that other people can see, you know, what it's like now, what it used to be like. I have so many comments of people who say, you know, like I did a video about Mormon missions. I have so many people, like a surprisingly large amount of people 
who comment about how they are no longer planning on serving a mission because of that video and because of the other resources they've been consuming about Mormonism and about Mormon missions. And so this education, this is actually information that people need to know. They don't, you know, when you join the Mormon church, they don't tell you this. When you grow up in the Mormon church, they don't tell you this. And this information is going to help people make real life choices, real legitimate choices with their actual lives. If they're going to serve a two year sales mission for the church or not, if they are going to wear religious underwear or not. So, you know, as much as sometimes I am just like, I'm just in my bedroom recording videos. Uh, I get direct messages from a lot of people who say that these videos are helping them make major life decisions. And so I think part of that is also having these comments of people saying, yeah, that happened to me. Yes, that's true. This is what it was like for me. Those are so powerful because it not only adds legitimacy to what I'm saying, but it, it also provides a record for people to read through while they seek out this information, while they watch this video, and it helps them make fundamental life choices. So you know, if you have the time here at the end of the video to type out a quick comment of what it was like for you to go through a Mormon temple, what it was like for you to wear garments, what it was like for you to receive the washing and anointing and new name, please uh, drop it below and I will see you all next week.